tomorrow morning, a great number of people sitting in this room today, and a great number of people in the Mason community and the surrounding community are going to get up, they're going to get in their cars, they're going to spend 30 to 45 minutes in traffic, and they're going to go to a job. When they get to the job, they're going to be encouraged to crank up their RPMs well beyond the normal 4,000 of a typical car, but closer to 10,000 RPMs of a race car. And they're going to be encouraged to go, 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 and run, 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 because time is money. And if you can do a breakfast meeting followed by a lunch meeting, and you can skip your family time and have a dinner meeting, you can get more money, you can have more impact, your business can grow faster, and you can get a greater promotion, and the income starts pouring in, and the accolades start coming, and it is addictive, and I'm tired just talking about it. <laughs> How many of you know what I'm talking about? The world teaches us both whether we're in school, whether we're in education, whether we're in the business course, whether we're in construction, whatever our marketplace is, we are taught that we are go, 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 do, 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 more, 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 and that's what life's all about. And you don't have to be in the business world or the marketplace to do that. If you are a parent and you've got a couple of little ones at home and maybe a full-time and or a part-time job, you know that no matter how hard you work, no matter how hard you try, you know no matter how much money you bring in, those little varmints are still going to spill Kool-Aid on the carpet. They're still going to vomit on your clean clothes. They're still going to cry at 2 in the morning when you need to sleep because the alarm's going to go off at 5.30 because you've got to get up and go, go, go. And if you're a single parent who has that kind of job and those kinds of children, and you don't have the help of a second parent, multiply that out by about seven or eight, right? We are just running at Mach 5 pace and speed through our lives. And there's no time for rest. And there's not a quiet moment. And there's not a reflective one either. But every once in a while, we come across someone Maybe where we worship. Maybe where we work. Maybe the park where our children play or the path where we walk our dog. Who has this kind of character about them. Who has this unsettling presence about them. And it knocks us off course just a little bit because their life is not like our life. There is something authentic about them. There is strength in their character. There is confidence in their disposition. And we learn that there are some people in life who somehow manage to balance the demands of the workplace, the requirements in the home place, with authentic Christianity that makes those of us who long and hunger for that kind of relationship with God to take a step back and wonder what the secret sauce is. See, authentic Christians aren't people who identify with a set of doctrines and adhere to them and then march in place to the same cadence of the same drummer all towards that. Authentic Christians are unsettling. Authentic Christians march to a different beat than most people. Authentic Christians will knock us off of, a, off of our course with their, with their commitment, with their zeal, with their confidence, with their demeanor, with their behavior, with their joy. You see, authentic Christians are people who understand what it means to have an authentic relationship with the living God. They understand that there is something supernatural that gets infused into humanity. When we recognize that it's not a static set of rules, a static set of do's and don'ts, a static set of doctrines that we all adhere to and sign off on, but authentic Christians understand that it's all about having a supernatural relationship where He infuses Himself into our lives and He is living and He is dynamic and He is loving and He is caring. Does anybody in here know what I'm talking about? And God says, that's the kind of relationship I want to have with you. But we get so caught up in all these kinds of things and we forget that sometimes it's in those reflective moments, it's in those quiet moments when we search God out and we seek God out and it feels like we don't have the time. And this is not a 21st century issue. This is not an American issue. This is not an Arizona issue. This is not a Mesa issue. This is a all of humankind. 
time since the beginning of time issue. How do I know that? Because thousands of years ago, a little shepherd boy out on the hillside, busy 24 and 7, chasing down sheep, said these words in Psalm 46.10. Be still and know that your paycheck comes from being busy. <laughs> no. He says, be still and know that I am God. Years ago, I used to work with juvenile delinquents, the worst of the worst. I was literally on call 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. I covered a broad territory, nearly half of the state back in the east. And my day started really early, and they ended late, and they were go, 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 nonstop, nonstop. And as much as I love Jesus, I reached a point where I felt like my life was out of control. Can you relate to that? And here's what I've come to understand. The issue of prayer is that prayer is a lot like exercise. You know you need to do it, but most of the time you don't feel like you want to. That's why there's a line in your outline there. If you want to look in the middle of your worship folder, the line says these words. Just as exercise reminds you to be careful of the things you eat daily, prayer reminds you to be careful of the choices you make daily. Long ago, when I was like a teenager, I heard one of those evangelists at the old time camp meeting we used to go to when I was a kid make this statement. He said, most of you out there in that room today love Jesus. Most of you would never think about going out and getting yourself caught up into a lifestyle of sinful behaviors. But most of you don't understand the power of prayer. He then went on to say these words. And here's what I know. If Satan can't make you sin, he'll make you busy. I think that's a lot like many of us in this room this morning and many other churches around the, the uh, valley today. There are a lot of people who love Jesus. There are a lot of people who have no interest in going out and... and getting caught up in whatever style of lifestyle of sin or back to what you have, but you get so busy doing things that you think you ought to do, things that are good, things that are worthwhile, that you get so busy that you disconnect yourself from the very thing that gives you the power, the energy, the resource to go on and do the supernatural things you say you want to do and sing about when you're sitting in here, but you walk out those doors and forget. Here's what I understand, folks. A lot of you in here are hardworking people. You work hard at your job. You work hard at your family. You work hard at raising your children. You work hard at loving your grandchildren. You work hard at school. And so my thought is this. If you work so hard in all these other elements of your life, why would you settle for mediocrity in your relationship with Jesus Christ? Connect Church, hear me. Because of all these things going into your life, you are too busy not to pray. Amen. Now here's the question. Why pray? Why should we pray? Well, I think the number one reason we should pray is because Jesus prayed. And Jesus models for us the value and the necessity of prayer. In Mark chapter 1, we read these words. Before daybreak the next morning, Jesus got up and went out to an isolated place to pray. Now let's pause. Why did Jesus go out before daybreak, before the sun came up? Because the moment the sun came up, Jesus was immense, was immediately and immensely busy. People thronged to him. He had things to do and places to go and people to reach. In fact, if you were to read all of Mark chapter 1, it would be like the greatest action film ever. Because in those first verses of John chapter 1, we read about Jesus and all the preaching and teaching that he did. We read about Jesus and all the healing that he did. When I'm saying healing, I don't mean they had a special service and called in the television cameras and raised to the big offering. I'm talking about as he went through town, people came to him and said, touch me, heal me, pray for me. And we talk about, and then he would deliver people from demons. And if you read the earlier chapter, verses of Mark chapter 1, this was a daily, regular occurrence. He went out before daybreak to pray. Years ago, I adopted for my own life this little practice. You can write it in the margins. It's not in your notes. Earliest, first, or nothing at all. Here's what I mean by that. I strive in my life to give the earliest part of the day because Jesus gave the earliest part of the day. But I understand that I'm going to go through a day and I don't know what that day is going to hold. And if I haven't spent
spent time with him, I make myself vulnerable to whatever enemy attacks or temptations might come along that day. I do that earliest on my typical work days. On my days where I'm off or it's not a typical day, I'm on vacation, I don't get up quite as early, but I still do the first. I still spend the time with Jesus because here's what I know about me. Well, it's one thing for me to stand up here and share this conversation with you. If I don't have those two disciplines, your pastor can get so caught up in whatever it is he's going to do that day, anything from walking the dogs to leading a service to praying with people to sitting through an elders meeting, that I don't give Jesus anything at all. For those two disciplines have marked my life because Jesus did them. Now, why did Jesus do them? Jesus got up and went out to an isolated place to pray. Later, Simon and the others went to find him. And Paul's right here at verse number 37. And when they found him, what did they say to him? Talk to me. <laughs> so if everyone is literally looking for you, does that mean you're going to have a dull day, with a dull moment, nothing else to do but sit in coffee shops and hang out? That means you've probably got a lot to do. Whether you're in construction, or medicine, or education, or business, or you work in a factory, or you drive for UPS, Everybody's looking for you. That means that you're going to have a full docket, right? Now, here's what I'm wondering before we get to the next screen. I'm wondering if Jesus acquiesced to that or if Jesus understood there was a greater purpose to his life and he needed to continue to practice that. Before we get to the next screen, what would be your guess? Let's see what Jesus did. But Jesus replied, we must go on to other towns as well. In other words, Jesus didn't give in to the tyranny of the moment. He understood his purpose. And I will preach to them, too. That is why I came. Jesus understands that he had a purpose. Now, Jesus has been, if you were to go on and read the next verse, in verse number 30, 39, Jesus, it would say that Jesus went on to the next town and did two things. He preached the gospel and cast out demons. He preached the gospel, he cast out demons. Consistent with action, Jesus, that we see all throughout the gospel of Mark, Chapter number one. Now here's my thought. Here's my question for you this morning. Jesus is the Son of God, right? He's fully God come to earth, but Jesus is also fully human. So here's the question. What did Jesus know about prayer that you and I don't? First thought right there in your worship folder if you want to fill this in. Jesus understood that prayer initiates the power of God. Prayer initiates the power of God. In verse number 32, Jesus is going through, hearing the Gospel of Mark in chapter 1, and he's been teaching, and people come to him, and he's, the, and he's delivering them from evil spirits or demons, depending on the translation you read. And in verse number 32, it says that the demons knew who he was, and so they dared not even speak. Now here's the thing. We think that because Jesus is the Son of God, fully human, but fully God. They knew who he was. And so they respected him, so to speak. But we never think that we can have that same power. And yet, Jesus went on to tell the disciples that when they prayed and do all these things, that they would also cast out demons, and they would do greater things than he did. Let me ask you a rhetorical question. When was the last time because of your presence and the power of God in your life because of the power of prayer in your life, the demons in our community shook when you walk in the room. The demons wouldn't even speak. Here's what you've got to know, folks. Our enemy, the evil one, Satan, Lucifer, whatever name you call him, the devil, hates prayer. And the last thing that he wants is for you to know the power of prayer. So you know what Satan does? He tricks most of us into treating prayer like our Christmas wish list. Where we go to Jesus and we say, oh, you are good and I want and I need and would you give me, and give me this and give me that. Cowboy suit and a baseball bat. Oh, no one came with anything. Instead of asking God like Christ did for an infusion of Himself that releases prayer 
the power of prayer, not just in us, but through us. Now here at Connect Church, we actually have a pretty strong emphasis on prayer. And to tell you a bit more about that, Greg, would you come on up here and join me for a moment? This is Greg Roberto. Greg leads a lot of our prayer initiatives around here. Greg, tell me just a minute about some of the things we do. All right. Uh, yeah, this is interrupt this uh, message for this uh, ad about prayer. Um, every uh, every Sunday after the service, we have people up front. We call them right now prayer partners, and uh, it's for people who who want to share a concern for the week, or they want to share praise. You know, Paul said in Romans that. You rejoice with people who rejoice and you mourn with those who mourn. And he also said, pray for one another. So we, we would love to hear people say, hey, I had a great week, this happened. You know, we, we talk about, oh, I just got fired from my job. But nobody ever jumps up and says, you know, I just got promoted. Or my, my daughter just did accomplish this, or my, my son won in a soccer game. Those are things that we can praise each other, or praise God for each other. Now starting tomorrow, Monday, 6.30 at the, uh, the Kids Church, uh, what we call the Warehouse, we're going to have a weekly prayer meeting. We invite all of you to come. We're going to look at uh, the model prayer in, in, uh, in Matthew 6, and we're going to kind of go off of that blueprint as to how we pray for each other and, and for God's glory. And everything you do, you do it for the glory of God, and that includes prayer. Also, we have people uh, before the service and during the service praying for each one of you. There are times that I'm sitting here at, on Sunday morning, and I just sit here and pray that the Holy Spirit will just cover everyone, and Satan will not have a way to get into this service. Uh, we had a prayer meeting a couple months ago, and I just sat there and prayed for each person who was there during the prayer meeting that they would have a good week and that what they're saying in the prayer meeting would carry over for the rest of the week. I listen to people uh, pray and they pray much better than me. Uh, David uh, is marvelous. My wife Jean prays. I, I turn on Chuck's window not for the message just to hear him pray. And there's other people that you can say, yeah, this is, this is the way I can pray. We're not trying to be uh, eloquent. We're not trying to be the best prayers. We just want to be diligent and faithful prayers and bring the glory to God. And now back to the sermon. <laughs> and you appreciate Greg. You say thank you. <laughs> so that's the answer to the question, why pray? Now if we begin praying, what are the effects of prayer? Here's what you've got to know just up front. Prayer can wake up the church, not just this church, but the church. Prayer can propel your marriage to greatness. Prayer can save your children. Prayer can empower your career. Prayer can make you mighty for God, but there is always a catch. Anything worthwhile is worth doing right. And a quality prayer life where you're seeking and reaching and unleashing the power of God within you requires sacrifice. You'll have to give something up. For some of us, you're going to have to give up some of your social media time. For others of us, you're going to have to give up your television time. Some of us would have to give up some of our eating time. Some of us have to give up some of our gardening time. Some of us would have to sacrifice some of our sleep time. You get to choose how much power of God through time invested in prayer you want in you, but it always costs us something. Jesus told his disciples in Mark chapter 11, he said, have faith in God. And if you have faith in God and don't doubt, you can tell this mountain to get up and jump into the sea and it will. And everything you ask for in prayer will be yours. If only you have faith. And whenever you stand up to pray, you must forgive what others have done to you. Then your Father in heaven will forgive your sins. Stay right there for a second. There are there are two places where this, these two verses appear. They appear here in the Gospel of Mark on a conversation about prayer. And they appear in the Gospel of Matthew when the disciples asked Jesus to model, about a model prayer. And he gave them what we call the Lord's Prayer. And then once it ends, the only thing that Jesus editorializes from within that prayer is on the forgiveness of others. 
And he says those words. Here's the deal, folks. If you're going before God, who has forgiven you of your sin, and you're harboring a grudge, or you're harboring judgment, or you're harboring unforgiveness in your heart towards someone else, your ability to connect with God will never transcend the lack of forgiveness that you're going to God within your heart. God wants you to forgive others the same measure that He has forgiven you. Now that's one translation. I love how Eugene Peterson in the message paraphrase uh, does this same thing. Jesus was very matter of fact. Now to me that says he was from the Midwest. Uh, <laughs> embrace this God life. Really embrace it and nothing will be too much for you. This mountain, for instance, as Jesus was looking at the mountains and talking to the disciples, just say, go jump in the lake. No shuffling or shilly shally. I love that theological phrase, shilly shally. That's for shuffling. Um, and it's as good as done. That's why I urge you to pray for absolutely everything, ranging from small to large. Include everything as you embrace this God life and you'll get God's everything. And when you assume the posture of prayer, Remember, it's not all asking. If you have anything against someone, forgive. Only then will your Heavenly Father be inclined to also wipe your slate clean of sins. See, when I think about this whole thing about going to God, and I love that where he says, not in small things to the large things, my mind immediately goes through the pages of Scripture, and those stories are in there for a reason. And I think about the boldness of Moses and the faith of Elijah and the passion of Ezra and the brokenness of Nehemiah. I think about a New Testament couple that you don't hear a whole lot about. His name was Zacharias and her name was Elizabeth and she couldn't have children. And then God moved in their midst and they gave birth to one child and his name was John the Baptist and he paved the way for Jesus Christ. I think about Peter the coward who stood in the garden when the little girl identified him as one of the Jesus people just a few weeks later preaching with incredible power on the day of Pentecost. I think about Paul, the greatest persecutor the church had ever known, turning into the greatest missionary the church had ever known, and how Paul would pray for the church. That's why there's a phrase there in your notes that says this, faith moves mountains, prayer moves God. Faith moves mountains, prayer moves God. Why do we phrase it like that? We'll talk about faith in just a moment. But why does prayer move God? Because most of the time when we refer to God, we refer to Him as our Heavenly Father, right? How many dads do we have in here? How many of you love your children? How many of you, if it's within your power, would do anything you could to help your child? Most of your hands are still up. In the same kind of way, it's the heart of a father. Where do you think my dad gets that heart for his children? It's given to you through the DNA of our Heavenly Father who wants to do the same thing for His children. It's about how much He loves us. And, uh, and when you read this verse, don't misunderstand what's being said here. God's not in the excavation business, okay? He's not driving around heaven with a backhoe looking for a hill to move. It's symbolic. God saying, whatever that mountain is in your life, it could be a financial mountain, it could be an impossible marriage situation. It could be a difficult job situation. It could be a new job situation. It could be a wayward child. It could be something about your physical health and well-being, your mental health and well-being. It could be about Connect Church and this building and the unending construction process. <laughs> it could be about the community drug, meth, heroin issue going on in the 85205. But here's what I want you to understand. God's not in the excavation business. And when you go to God and, and you're looking at whatever that symbolic mountain is in your life, here's the key to all of it. Never focus on the size of the mountain. Always focus on the sufficiency of the mountain mover. Here, they get you a little bit excited. Never focus on the size. How I many of you have some large mountains in your life? How I many of you sometimes feel overwhelmed by those mountains? It's okay, I got them. Don't focus on the size of the mountain. Focus on the sufficiency, the grandiosity, the love, the holiness, the omnipotence of the mountain mover. And you focus on that because when you pray, folks, when you pray, here's what you're doing. You're confessing your dependence on God. And when you don't pray, you're professing your dependence on yourself. Earliest 
first or nothing at all. You're leaving the house without having spent time with God. You're making yourself vulnerable to that mountain every day of your life. Why pray? Because Jesus did. How to pray? Just come to Him with boldness and don't doubt. Have faith, believing that He's going to do what He says He's going to do. And then, how do you pray? This one's really simple. It comes from a, a great author that I've read over the years by the name of Ronnie Floyd. Ronnie Floyd says, effective prayers occur when you talk to God and you listen to what God is saying to you. Now, when we talk about talking to God, there are a couple of thoughts that come to mind. One of them is, on one hand, we make prayer way too complicated. When you're talking with God, it's no different than, in essence, except for the respect for who He is, than having a conversation with anybody sitting in the same room as you today. Having a conversation with a family member, a friend, a co-worker. Talking the things to him. What, what would you say to God? Well, you can say pretty much anything you want. But as it relates to this conversation, I would say, when you start talking to God, are there things on your heart that you need to confess to him? You're like, well, he knows it all anyway. The confession isn't for him. It's for me. It's for you about opening our hearts up and being authentic and transparent before God. You're right. He does know it anyway. He's just waiting on you to share it with Him. And then He's going to wrap His arms around you and prove you just how loving and great and wonderful He is. But start out confessing some things to Him. Maybe have some time where you praise Him. Now, praise is different than thanksgiving. When we praise God, we're acknowledging He is. That He is the supreme being. He is the creator of life. He is the provider of life eternal. His love is relentless. When we're doing thanksgiving, we're thanking God for the good things He's done in our lives. Thank you, God, for healing my wrist. Thank you, God, for saving my son. Thank you, God, for the new job. Thank you, God, when I, didn't, when I had more month than money and I had no idea how I was going to pay my rent, and yet you provided a way. I don't know how, but thank you, God. Every time you write that tie check or drop a thing in the offering or you go online and you give digitally, thank you, God, that I have the capacity by your hand and your goodness to give this money back to you through this church so that we can reach the 85205. Thank you, God, for my spouse. Thank you, God, that I got a bed to sleep in. Thank you, God, that I ate today. You understand the difference between praise and thanksgiving? Share a little bit of that with him. Some petitions. Who are you going to pray for? God, I've got this issue going on in my life. I need your help. Or intercession. God, I've got a friend, and my friend recently found out that there's a, there's a mass in their chest. My friend recently found out that their son's strung out with drugs. My friend recently had their car break down. God, how, how can you help them? How can I possibly help them? You start interceding for God for the things that you can't do. And yet this phrase says that we talk to God, and we also listen to God. What are you listening for? Well, in the quietness of that moment, maybe you've got a, a song in front of you and God is speaking to you through that song. You're not crying out to Him. You're just meditating on His Word and He speaks to you through His Word. And don't be in a rush and don't be in a hurry. You know, we get down and we got down. Don't know, that ball game comes on in five minutes and yet I promise God I've given 15 minutes of prayer today. Don't get in a hurry. That's why God didn't be you guys. <laughs> he loves you enough to let you honor him and watch football. Allow God to speak to you. Allow God to reach into your heart. Allow God to massage your heart. Allow God to work through your emotions. You say, David, I try that. When I sit down and it's quiet, I have all these thoughts running through my head. What do I do? You kneel there. And you let the thought go clear across the screen of your mind, and then it leaves, and you go back to pray. Then you go back to talking to Jesus. And you just have a conversation with him. And you know what you're going to learn? You're going to learn that the supreme being of life 
The creator of life and the provider of life eternal is intensely and immensely interested in you. He cares about the things you care about. He's concerned about the things you're concerned about. He wants the best for you. He is the good, good father. He wants to know the things that bring you fear. He wants to know the things that bring you joy. He wants to know the things that bring temptation in your life. And he wants to know and share the victories and the joys in your life as he's helped you through or helped you help others. Father, thank you for your goodness today. Thank you for sharing yourself with us today. Thank you for giving us the privilege of sharing a prayer with you today. We acknowledge you in all of your ways. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.